I don't know if you're going to be able to hear the um, scurrying sounds of dogs. Uh, Oreo is playing with her brothers. Finally, they're playing with her. Uh, so if you hear that, it is what it is. As long as I've been making videos about Tiberius from Critical Role, I have not used any clips of his behavior that I found troubling or objectionable. That's been an extremely deliberate choice, and there are a few reasons. One, I don't own this content, and I don't want to ruffle the feathers of the folks who do by using those clips. You know, any more than I may have already done by making videos about this subject. Second, and more importantly, I don't want to include these clips when some of them might be frustrating, upsetting, or potentially even triggering for some audience members to watch. The only way to offer a proper content warning is to lay out exactly what's going to happen in the clip, and at that point, there's really no point in using the clip. And third, I don't really feel the need to recirculate clips of Orion Akaba from arguably the lowest point in his life. That just doesn't interest me. However, we have reached the point where it's very, very difficult to discuss this topic without using clips. So, in light of all of that, let's really discuss some of the most objectionable behavior of Orion Akaba. On Critical Role, at least. First, let's talk about the metagaming. There are a few times on the show when he finds out there might be a certain type of monster, and his real-world knowledge overpowers him. And before the DM can have a chance to jump in and figure out what's reasonable for his character to know or not, he's already acting on that knowledge. We can see that in action in this moment in the Underdark. Ask what color the worm is. What color is it? The worm? Yeah. It's more of a dark uh, purple color. It's a dark purple color. Super duper fuck. Huh. That was weird. I, I don't know how that clip got in there. That's from an old actual play show I used to do years ago. We don't even make that show anymore. Um, okay, anyway, let's move on. Okay, let's talk about the errands and the shopping. In this episode especially, Tiberius grinds the game to a halt in the middle of a pretty pivotal story arc, it must be said, just to do a bunch of shopping and get a bunch of equipment and try to get even more overpowered than he already was. So Teddy, here's a couple things that we're looking for. Uh -huh. um, we need to find a way to help us with some um, intelligence-based attacks. So I've heard of legendary items that can help us enhance certain abilities. If there's a, there's a tome that I know of that can help enhance oh, your intelligence. Uh, well, we would also love a ring of protection. A pair of sending stones would be great. All, uh, uh, wand of magic missiles. Wand of magic detection. I have an idea. Potions. How would you know on potions? Because I would love either fire breath or gaseous form. Hmm, let's uh, ignore those. I, I don't know why that happened again. Well, then, of course, there's the biggest elephant in the room. The joke. In this episode, Orion makes a joke that really seems to upset the other players. And even if they hadn't been upset, the joke itself was, at best, thoughtless, and at worst, pretty offensive. I want 1,000 <laughs> words on what the fuck's going on, and I really hope you're a Southpaw. What if the arm that she lost... Was... That's, that's what a Southpaw... Southpaw is someone who's left-handed. Uh, so I'm mocking someone with a disability. Oh, great. <laughs> like so, a hero does. Like a hero like does. Paws aren't disabilities. No, but she's missing an arm. Oh, got it. Why we talk about Tiberius. Part 1. A recap of Critical Role Episode 27, The Path to Whitestone. Welcome to Critical Role Demystified, I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn, as DMs and as players, from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're discussing Episode 27 of the Vox Machina campaign, The Path to Whitestone. Except I'm not going to offer any lessons this time. All I'm going to do is offer a completely neutral recounting of the events of episode 27 of the Vox Machina campaign. There will be very minimal commentary, minus a few aspects where I try to clarify something or try to offer my best guess at an explanation. But today, I'm just recounting the facts as plainly as I can. As the episode opens, Percy has turbulent dreams in his workshop, remembering the attack on his home. And then he hears a voice discussing their bargain and urging more action from him. He wakes up and emerges from his workshop where he discovers Desmond and Jarrett being attacked by a pair of invisible stalkers. They're like uh, invisible air elementals. The fight breaks out. This is just as Vox Machina is returning to the keep, so it takes most of them a few rounds before they finally join the fight. 
This is a fight with a lot of participants in a tight space against some invisible, semi-intangible monsters. There's not really a ton to learn from this fight, honestly. Early in the fight, Orion mentions he doesn't know what they're fighting and proudly declares that he is not metagaming. After the fight, they promise Desmond that they're going to keep him safe and apologize for failing to do so. They move Desmond upstairs to share a room with Grog. Since an underground locked cell doesn't seem to be able to keep the Briarwood servants out, they might as well get rid of the lock so Vox Machina can get to him quicker if there is a next time that the attack happens again. After Vox Machina rests, they are met by Seeker Assume, who they haven't seen since they were read the Riot Act in Uriel's throne room. In that scene, Keyleth had cured his mind of Silas Briarwood's influence, but Uriel had pretended nothing had happened. Now, in their keep, Assume apologizes for the ruse. He had to make it seem like nothing had changed so he could assess the situation. And now, he has deduced that Sovereign Uriel seems to be under the same charm as he was. Uriel is now an unwitting ally of the Briarwoods. The party debates sneaking into the palace to try to cure Uriel, but that trip would be a gamble that could end in their deaths. A few times, Tiberius suggests they invite Uriel to a dinner where they can try to cure him there, but the others remind him that Uriel would never accept that invite given the current circumstances. Meanwhile, Seeker Assume is preparing to leave for, White Mount, for Wild Mount in a day to research where the Briarwoods came from. So the other option is to go and kill the Briarwoods in Whitestone, and hopefully that will end the charm on Uriel. Tiberius also mentions that, if worse comes to worst, he can use his status as an ambassador for Draconia to call on the Draconian Knights, and they can have an army at their side. As Vex describes a possible plan to gather intelligence and wait for Seeker Assume to return from Wildmount, Orion makes a joke that Tiberius has a half-chub, aka a partial erection. The other players do not laugh, and some appear uncomfortable or even upset. As they ask Percy to weigh in, which he's been very reluctant to do so, he hears a voice in his ear that no one else hears, saying, Vengeance. Vengeance. And he finally agrees that they should go to Whitestone. Tiberius suggests a few times that they need Assume's help to clear their departure with the council and requests Assume remain in town for a week. If they're going to take that time to prepare for the journey, he could smooth things over regarding their departure. But the other members of Vox Machina insist they should not tell anyone where they're going because they're not going to get permission, no matter how nicely they ask or whether or not Assume helps them. So the party begins preparations over the course of a week before they leave the keep. Percy tinkers, and one thing he tries to build is essentially an Archimedes death ray. I personally have no idea what that is, but Taliesin and Matt do, so that's what's important. Orion says a few times that Taliesin doesn't need to do this. Tiberius could use his magic for the same purpose if Percy wants to tinker on other stuff. But Percy still wants to try, so he makes a few rolls. He tries several times and rolls pretty high, but considering the complexity of the task and perhaps knowing how high Percy's modifier is and how high these rolls have the potential to go if Taliesin rolled higher, the results are not high enough for Matt's liking. He's unable to produce the item in the time they have, the week before they leave for Whitestone. The group buys wooden stakes, holy water, holy oil, and healing potions. Vax gets a holy symbol for Saren Ray and asks around about Kynan, but he's gone and no one knows where he went. Scanlan buys a scroll of spirit guardians and some chainmail chokers for everyone's necks to protect them from vampire bites. Grog buys a shovel and a pickaxe and rolls a week's worth of beard checks and grows his full beard. Here are Tiberius's errands. He picks up his canteen of endless water from the Temple of Serenray, and now the first time he produces water from the bottle every day, the water already contained in the bottle will be holy water. He gets his bladed quarterstaff enchanted to deal plus one magical damage. He tries to get his plus one ring of protection enchanted to be stronger, but it would take most of a year and cost 25,000 gold pieces. Instead, he asks about enchanting the ring of spell storing, but it would take a year, and cost 60,000 gold pieces, and he'd have to do that on his own time, since nobody else offers that service. What he has is the highest available version of the ring, unless he can create something else on his own. He wants to train Lockheed every day to do many things, but Matt says he has to pick one, since Lockheed also needs attention and care outside of training. So Tiberius trains Lockheed to be quiet. He goes to every shop in Amman and wants to buy as many mirrors as he can. He wants to buy 15,000, but Matt says he's only able to find and buy 35. Presumably, Tiberius is trying to gather the materials needed to make an Archimedes death ray by, I'm guessing, casting tele telekinesis on the mirrors. He wants to make a crossbow bolt that casts a fog spell with holy water mist instead of ordinary water vapor, but Matt says the fog spell enchantment can't be changed. Tiberius then wants to try to make a crossbow bolt that conjures a mixture of a fog spell and a sleep spell, but Matt says that isn't how it works. The enchantments won't stack. 
Orion suggests maybe they just try super hard. Matt says, sure, go ahead and roll. And even with Orion's very good roll, the project costs 500 gold in materials and ultimately fails. And according to Matt, Tiberius has now learned definitively that enchantments cannot be stacked in that way. This is when Travis says, how about you get nothing else and we move on? Orion says he wants to do one more thing, despite Travis's further protestations. Tiberius goes to see Allura again, but they're still not allowed in the Cloudtop District. He then asks about making a sleep-enchanted crossbow bolt, and Matt gives him a quote that would still be very expensive, but would be faster than what the book says. Matt said it would normally take four weeks, but he'll allow Tiberius to pay a mage a lot of money to enchant a bolt in only one week. He spends the last of his money and creates two sleep bolts, and says that his errands are complete. Keyleth buys an alchemy set and tries to make a healing potion. Then she tries to enchant a bottle of holy water with a fog cloud spell to make a holy water fog bomb. She's effectively curious if a different tactic, using an existing source of holy water rather than a holy enchantment, will produce the holy grenade mist effect that they're looking for. However, Matt says that the fog cloud spell would have to be enchanted on the glass, so breaking the glass activates the spell, but won't infuse the fog with holy water mist. That holy water would still just break open and hit one person. Keyleth commits to this course of action because she already said she was going to try to do it, so she has a bottle of holy water that will conjure an unholy fog spell when it breaks. I mean, not unholy, I mean a mundane fog spell when it breaks. I mean, not mundane, it's magical. You get it, you know what I mean. Scanlan drinks his scrying potion and leaves some poop in a jar and puts it on the mantle so they can look back on the keep whenever they need to. Just to make sure that everything's okay. Fox Machina pays the guards some hazard pay and increases the protection around Desmond while they're gone. Tiberius sends a messenger to ask Lord Daxio, the person who built their keep, and say that they want to convert the prisons into barracks for their soldiers. I'm assuming he means the guards who staff their keep, unless he's talking about the army from Deconia that he was discussing earlier. He tells the rest of the party that improving their reputation means not taking prisoners. So, he has decided they shouldn't have prison cells anymore. But they can't get the message through because Lord Daxio is a member of the Council of Tal'Dorei, and he is in the Cloudtop District, where Vox Machina and their staff are not allowed to enter. Seeker Assume teaches Vex a special ranger stealth skill. Tiberius sends a note to his father and tries to invoke the Ambassador's Right of Wartime to rally the armies and prepare for war once Tiberius is able to send evidence of the Briarwood's villainy. He receives a note back from his father, calling Tiberius immature, and saying he has just one chance to provide evidence, and it had better be extremely compelling. He also issues a reminder that invoking wartime is not Tiberius's domain as an ambassador. Only Tiberius's father carries that authority. The cast gives him a hard time about trying to rally an army, but we do overhear Laura say, that sucks, actually. No one at the table is actually delighted to hear Tiberius's father shit on him like that. Keyleth conjures a water elemental and binds it to the keep so it will remain for 30 days to help protect the keep and Desmond. They teleport to Westron and set out on horseback northeast into the mountains toward Whitestone. They cross a very creaky, rickety rope bridge, but they have to leave their horses behind. As they hike across the mountains, Vax and Scanlan fall, and Tiberius tries to use his telekinesis spell to catch them both, but Matt says he has to pick one. Orion shouts, Why, Matthew? Orion's argument is that the only limitation for the spell is the weight it can carry, but Matt answers that the spell has to be directed at a certain target. Tiberius grabs Vax, Keyleth catches Scanlan with a grasping vine spell. They hear some harpies fly past, and the party takes cover and hides. The harpies eat their horses. Vox Machina camps for them at night, and Tiberius tries to research liches. Throughout this episode, he's been referring to Whitestone as being full of vampires and liches. Perhaps he speculates that's what Delilah Briarwood is, or just thinks it's possible there is a lich in Whitestone. It's not clear. But this is where he learns that his researcher ability, from his background as a sage, doesn't mean he always has a book with all the information he needs in it. Instead, this ability allows him to go to places where knowledge is held, and know where he can search for information. This is something he'll have to do next time he's in a proper town or settlement where there's a genuine laboratory, or a library. During the night, Keyleth asks Percy about the moment when he declared, Your soul is forfeit in that fight. She asks if it really was just a cool line, or if he's serving something. He doesn't specifically mention the dream and the voice, but he does refer to getting inspiration to build the gun, though seems to indicate that the inspiration came from his quest for revenge. He also admits that he knows building the gun was a bad idea. This is also the second time in the episode that Marisha has rolled for insight on Percy to see if he's hiding something, but he doesn't seem to be. In the first instant, he rolled low and really seemed to believe what he was saying. 
In this case, he rolls higher than her, so she has to accept that Keyleth believes Percy in this moment. The next day, they continue along the path, and they encounter a huge, blue, many extra-legged lizard with crackling lightning breath. And that is the end of the episode. And with that, I've officially covered all of the Tiberius episodes of Critical Role. So, let's talk about Tiberius. Wait, that sounds familiar. I think I've said that before. Interlude. Reflecting on my first Tiberius video. When I launched my channel, I put out four Critical Role videos in the first week. This was very deliberate on my part. I wanted people who found the channel through those videos to see other content they might enjoy and get a sense of what kind of material I was making. The first video about how and where to start watching Critical Role is the one I expected to truly blow up. After all, Critical Role is such a daunting franchise to get into, it only makes sense that people would look for a video like that. My second video was about Tiberius and what the deal was with him. I figured, look, that might as well be his own video, but it's not going to do as well, and that's fine. In the intro, I literally called it an appendix to the where to start watching video. The third video was about the Matt Mercer effect, something people talk about all the time online. It's a constantly trending topic, so for sure that one would get a huge audience. And then, mainly because around that time I was seeing so many people speculate about how pre-planned Campaign 3 must be, I also put out a video about why Critical Role isn't scripted. Sure, I figured, might as well. It's not going to do as well as the other Matt Mercer Effect video, but it's a fun fourth video and something I felt I had a lot to say about. If you're familiar with my channel, you've probably figured out that I was wrong on all those counts. Don't get me wrong, the Where to Start Watching and Matt Mercer Effect videos did well. They're still on the higher end of views I've gotten on my channel overall. But the video about Critical Role being scripted took off in a huge way, and the Tiberius video exploded. If you're a fan of my channel, and especially if you were subscribed before, like, November of last year, there's a better than average chance you found me through the Tiberius video. In retrospect, I understand why that video did so well. Most of the Critter community has a policy where they just don't talk about Tiberius at all. That's why I made the video, because it's hard for new people to get information about exactly what happened, why this dude was on the show, and then just disappears after a while. And it especially makes sense that after the first season of the Vox Machina cartoon had just ended, folks would be going back to check out the live stream. After all, that's why I made that video about where to start watching Critical Role. And some of those people would have had a lot of questions about this Orion fella. But I truly underestimated just how many people would be looking for that information, and how well that video would do. So I want to take a look back at that video, address some of the commentary around it, and maybe shed some light on the parts that could have been clearer. First of all, I do stand by the content of that video. I feel that I covered the subject as respectfully as I could. And while there are plenty of commenters who feel that the way I talk about the subject is disrespectful, I totally understand that. This honestly comes down to the fact that not everyone has the same definition of what is respectful or not. Some people feel that just talking about this at all is rude, which, you know, fair enough. Others felt I was being too harsh to Orion, while some others still thought I was being too kind and giving him too much credit. All I can say is this was my attempt to be as respectful as I could while covering this topic. Second, there are some things I could have phrased better. That video now has more than a million views, and my only major regret is that I was still making videos based off of bullet points and not reading from a prepared script on a teleprompter. Because of that, there are some times I use the wrong words, or I phrase things poorly, and other times where I just didn't clarify the point I was trying to make as well as I would like. Well, here we are now. This is going to be my last video about Tiberius, so I'd like to address some parts of that video where I could have made myself clearer. Wow, I forgot how weird this video looks. My phone's camera settings were still on a weird default, and I had to do a bunch of color correction to fix it, and yet I didn't straighten out and level the image? Weird choice. That microphone also does me no favors. I definitely have a much better setup now. As I mentioned, he had a bit of a catchphrase. Hello, I'm Tiberius Stormwind from Draconia. As the show became popular early on, a lot of uh, bootleg or unofficial uh, fan content went online, including shirts. One of them was the uh, Hello, I'm sticker with Tiberius Stormwind from Deconia written on it. You know, the same way you might get, Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. It's a very silly shirt, but also both of those examples, the Inigo Montoya one and the Tiberius one, would kind of be illegal. Like, you're not allowed to do that. And Orion said as much. He said it was kind of not okay that this person was posting a shirt about his character without his permission, without his, his go-ahead. 
Should he have done that? I don't know. I personally don't think that the public forum was the best place to voice that opinion. It's so funny that this is the first thing I'm going to talk about in this part of the video because this is effectively the last thing that happened when Orion was a member of the cast of Critical Role. This incident with the shirt occurred after episode 27. This is actually a moment where some people have argued that I gave Orion too much credit. The argument I've seen in the comments is that the shirt wouldn't actually be an issue from a copyright perspective. Now, I personally don't know if that's true, but either way, the point still stands that this is something he should not have acted upon on his own. He should have brought this to the attention of Geek and Sundry's legal team and asked them to handle it, or even just asked if this is something that needed to be handled. As someone who used to work in the entertainment industry, I can tell you that platforms like Geek and Sundry and people like agents and managers exist for this exact reason. They are able to be the bad guy when needed and step in when fan content crosses a line. So that way the talent themselves are not perceived as the bad guys, as happened when Orion addressed this issue in a public forum. And eating at the table was a lot more common, but even once that had sort of been phased out, he was still doing it the most and the most often and the most noticeably. Okay, here's one where I just didn't make my point well. I set up my point, but I didn't pay it off. First of all, there are two points I want to make about eating at the table. First, there's nothing wrong with you or I eating while playing D&D. I just don't think the people who are doing it through an actual play show should eat at the table. It's distracting for the cast, it makes for unpleasant audio, it encourages crosstalk. Even now, eight years later, the folks at Critical Role still eat snacks at the table more than I would like. But in the early days of the show, they were eating full meals. And while they scaled that back a bit over the course of the first year, it's true that Orion did eat at the table more than the others. Now, is that the end of the world? No. Because despite how I phrase it in this video, that's not really the problem. But looking back on it and having rewatched all of his appearances over this past year, I think the issue that I failed to articulate is that I associate him eating at the table with him disengaging from events at the table. Now, it didn't only happen when he ate. Sometimes he would be deep in his notes, or he'd be discussing strategy with Sam and Marisha, and he would miss something so that somebody sat at the table. But it would still be really common for Orion to describe something Tiberius was doing, either going off on an errand, or even something like feeding Lockheed, and then he'd eat a meal and not seem to pay much attention to what the other members of the cast were doing. That's ultimately the argument I was trying to make. I'm sorry that it wasn't clear. But it also has to be acknowledged that other information has come out about him since then, that he had for example, done charity streams on his own and failed to deliver the money, or that he had done some Me Too-style crossing of lines with female collaborators in other projects. I don't remember all of the details, and ultimately I don't know if those were factors in why he left or his friction with Critical Role, I just know that those are things about him that, that have been addressed. Now here's another one where some folks felt I either gave too much credit to Orion, or that my priorities were just askew. In this section, I reference some drama that has been directed toward Orion since his leaving the show, but I did so in an extremely minor way. Now, some folks have reasonably pointed out that if these, accus if these accusations are true, then they're a much bigger deal than most of the other stuff I discuss in this video. And that's fair. But I didn't think I was making a drama video when I sat down to talk about Tiberius. So, I didn't dig into all these accusations because they weren't relevant to the reason I made the video to try to clear up what happened while he was on the show, and offer an explanation for why he's regarded the way he is once he left. I only touched on that controversy because, really, the only relevance it has is that it colors how Orion is perceived in the community. I deliberately didn't weigh in with any details, nor did I confirm that it happened or deny that it happened because it just wasn't relevant to the topic I was discussing. That may seem strange to you, but <clears throat> honestly, my goal was never to perform a character assassination on Orion Akaba, nor was it to absolve him of wrongdoing. My goal was to offer context to his appearances on Critical Role. If someone else really feels the need to dig into the actual drama of Orion and the people who leveled accusations towards him and make a video about it, go with God. But that's just not how I wish to live my life. If that bothers you, if you feel that ignoring these sorts of accusations is totally inappropriate, that's fine. I totally understand why you feel that way. But that's my mindset when discussing Orion. I choose to keep my attention primarily on his time as Tiberius on Critical Role. Another thing that I really did not talk about was that Orion had a subplot where he was kind of romancing Allura, the wizard that the party knew. And this was reciprocal. There was some definite interest expressed from Allura. But also, their first adventure, they go and they rescue Lady Kima from the dungeons in the Underdark, and they bring her back to Allura, and there is a definite implication that the two of them have a at least a romantic history or a romantic interest in each other. And Orion got 
really butthurt about this. Like he felt like he had, oh, oh, I guess I lost my chance. And he like pounded the table and went, really, Matthew? I'm not gonna show the clip, but it's weird and gross because there is a level of entitlement present there. There's a feeling that there is a expectation that he was going to get the girl. And Matt says, what, they're friends. But Orion is still like annoyed because, oh, I guess, I guess the girl I like is gay. Now, while I think that behavior was a form of homophobia, I don't, I'm not here saying that Orion was homophobic, but what he was, was feeling very entitled to a romantic subplot. And the moment, the moment that he felt like it wasn't going to happen, he got very pissy about it. That is some gross dude bro entitlement right there. Before I get to my next point, some folks have told me that they don't see Alora's relationship with Tiberius as being reciprocal. I don't personally agree. I do think there's romantic interest. In my opinion, we can see that in episode 24 when she offered to have a coffee and tea date with Tiberius. And then in episode 26, Matt describes her attitude toward Tiberius as heartbroken. It's possible Matt didn't mean to lead Orion on and she didn't have any interest, but that's personally not the impression I ever got. However, this is a moment where writing out a script means I could have chosen my words better. When I said homophobic, the word I was actually looking for was bisexual erasure, which, yes, is a form of discrimination. I guess you could argue it's still a form of homophobia, but bisexual erasure is more accurate to what I was trying to convey. The moment Orion saw that Alora and Kima had any sort of vibes, he seemed to feel that he had lost his shot and got really upset. Now, the point of this section was more intended to represent a form of toxic male entitlement toward having a love interest and being owed a love interest, but for the purposes of clarity, I just want to clear up the word I meant for that one section. A few episodes before he left the show, Orion was gifted a vest, like a long draping vest that was very much, it was deliberately the same style as what Tiberius wears in his character art. And for the final two episodes he's on the show, Orion just wears this to set. Now, I understand where that's coming from, and in theory, that's no different than Liam wearing a leather bracer for an episode because he got it from a fan or having a dagger at his desk because he was given it by a fan. Same with Travis, same with Taliesin having a fake gun that he opened up. You know, like, these are things that the cast was gifted by fans who were passionate, and I understand them having them at their desk or even wearing them for an episode or two. But again, he just wore this same article of clothing to be more like Tiberius twice in a row, and I, I don't know, I mean, how else do I describe it other than he was starting to get a little drunk on the Kool-Aid. But a few episodes before that, he had another example of very similar behavior. A fan gifted him a wrist-mounted flamethrower, and he wore it on set two weeks in a row. Here we go. This is by far the section I get the most comments on. And like, fair enough, I didn't make my point as well as I wish I had. The point I was trying to make here wasn't that anyone who wears a costume piece to play a game of D&D is bad. I've worn costume pieces while playing d and I spent a whole campaign wearing a necklace at every session to represent my character, so it would be enormously hypocritical to claim costume pieces in D&D are bad. I know why it comes across that way based on what I said, but that was not how I meant it. And look, as I said in the video, I understand both the impulse behind the vest and the flamethrower. I'm also someone who, at times, brings items to the table that link me to my character. When I played in an actual play show several years ago, I wrote all of my spells out in a spell book to better represent the character. The next time I get a chance to play in person in a long form campaign, I'm probably gonna do something similar. I have all sorts of notebooks. I can't open the door because of where I'm sitting. I have all sorts of notebooks that I'm saving for just that sort of opportunity to write things out and have totems. But the point of the vest comment wasn't to show that wearing a vest was bad. It was more to offer context to someone who had just worn a flamethrower for a few weeks and then was asked to stop. And then he immediately started wearing the vest instead. I thought that was noteworthy. I've also had many people argue that the flamethrower is safe. It doesn't have lighter fluid inside. This isn't arrested development. A device like that would have only included flash paper. So as long as there's nothing flammable in the area, it's fine. Fair enough. Except those tables were covered in character sheets and cups full of alcohol. And I haven't been able to find the clip. I, I think the one shot isn't up anymore, but I vividly remember the flamethrower going off by accident during a one-shot on the Geek and Sundry set, which seems to be why Tiberius uh, Orion stopped wearing it. Then again, none of that really explains why I said Orion wearing a vest was a problem. Because I'll be honest, on rewatching episodes 26 and 27, it still bugs me. But I have to wonder, would I care if you were any other cast member and not Orion during the final few episodes of his time as Tiberius? If it wasn't paired with other frustrating behavior, how much would it bother me? 
Heck, even if he'd started wearing it in episode four, when he's not doing as much that bothers me, would I care? I don't know that I would. I think the vest, in a weird way, has come to represent, at least in my mind, the transition into his most problematic behavior, even though functionally there's nothing to connect the vest to those actions. It's impossible for me to decouple these aspects of his time on the show purely because of the timing of it. This may not be a satisfying answer to you, and I can understand that. I never pretended my personal feelings didn't impact discussions of Tiberius' time on the show. I'm only human. But I do think the vest bothers me just because we had reached the point of Critical Role where a lot of the Ryan's behavior in these episodes bothers me. That's something that I don't know if I could have properly interrogated when I first made that video, but with the benefit of hindsight, looking back on this video after a year and after watching all of Orion's episodes, that's my best explanation for why I discussed the vest the way that I did. Now, while I'm glad to have the opportunity to clarify those points that weren't as clear or strong as they could have been if I had actually used a script, I still stand by this original video. Sometimes, a player has become such a disruptive influence, such a challenge to deal with, that you have to make a tough choice. Episode 27 is Orion Akaba's last episode, and when you watch knowing that, you can practically feel it coming, feel the tension at the table rising to a boil. But of course, with hindsight, we all know it's his last episode, so it feels like his last episode. Would we say the same thing if episode 26 were his last? Or episode 16, when his only problematic behavior was trading an item with Scanlan and casting telekinesis to help Vex shoot the arrow? What if it had been after something like episode 23 or 24, something less charged? Regardless, the fact that this is how his last episode played out certainly led the community, myself obviously included, to believe that he left the show due to his increasingly disruptive behavior. But we also knew there was a lot they weren't saying, and after his statements in early 2016, it seemed like there must be some mitigating circumstances. He had confirmed that he was dealing with substance abuse and suffering from diseases. I don't cover those topics very much in my first video because the only confirmation of them had been in a live stream or a video posted by Orion, which was now no longer available. So I assumed he no longer wanted that information out there, and I wanted to respect his privacy. That may seem ironic to some of you, but I genuinely do care about his privacy in these matters. He took down that video so I didn't share the details that he had disclosed when he previously talked about it in early 2016. However, Orion commented on my first Tiberius video and basically clarified that the reason he left the show wasn't because of his behavior, it was because he had been abusing drugs and alcohol. He said the same in a podcast interview on an episode of The Voice in Your Head from 2021, which is a show and an episode I wasn't aware of when I made my first video in early 2022. And I really do want to thank Orion for commenting. He, he didn't have to do that. And he didn't have to do it in such a respectful way. He easily could have just subtweeted about me, especially considering I was essentially digging up some unsavory moments from his public life several years later in a video that sort of went viral. According to his comment and other statements, he has been clean and healthy for years, and his diseases no longer threaten his life. And I'm genuinely glad he is healthy, and I hope he has found some genuine peace. But as I said, the stated reason I made that video was to shed light on why he left Critical Role, which was because of his behavior at the table. And according to Orion, that reason is not accurate. Apparently, it wasn't his metagaming, or his main character syndrome, or as many folks in the comments speculated, his dice fudging. Instead, it really was for legal liability reasons that he had to part ways with Geek and Sundry. And his is the only public statement we have in this matter, so there's no percentage in questioning that narrative. We could keep speculating as we have done for eight years, or we can take this little piece of information that we have, assume that it's true, and move forward. Which begs the question, if I got that part of the video wrong, and therefore failed to achieve its stated purpose, why didn't I take the video down? Well, first the video was made in good faith, with the information I had at the time, and it was an effort to onboard new fans onto the situation with Tiberius. It's tough for new critters to find information, because so much of the critter community prefers not to talk about it. But second, the reason I didn't take the video down is because, to be completely honest, shedding light on the events that took place on the show is only part of the reason I made the video. Part 2. The Troubling Behavior from Episode 27 Now that we've gotten through the recap of the episode, let's drill down on the difficult Tiberius moments and what we can learn from each one. Early on, when they're fighting the invisible assassins in Grey Skull Keep, Orion expresses pride that he doesn't know what they're fighting, and points out that he's not metagaming, something considered worthy of remark at this point in the campaign. 
We've talked about his metagaming plenty over the past few episodes, and it's been argued that his actions in episode 11 are also due to metagaming, although I don't agree, but I've already discussed that. Specifically, most of Orion's metagaming in these last few episodes manifested through the form of knowledge about the monsters, or at least that seems to be the behavior that he was correcting. I'd argue he also tended to act on other information as well, like knowing that something was happening and where. Heck, even as early as episode 1, when Vex and Keyleth aren't getting the information they need out of an NPC, Tiberius walks over unprompted to chime in and roll with his very high persuasion skill. That's also a form of metagaming, but it's one that was a lot more common with the cast early on. However, by episode 24, Matt was pointing out this was a form of metagaming when Marisha did it. And yet, in the next episode, Orion's example was particularly egregious, as Tiberius charged towards the Briarwoods in their room and pretended to use water to harm the vampires, which is a lot of information he wouldn't have had access to. Knowing about the kind of monster is just one form of metagaming, and not the only one we've seen from him across what I think of as Act 3 of the Tiberius era. As they discuss their strategy for how to deal with the Briarwood issue, Orion makes a joke about Tiberius getting an erection. Now, there is a lesson we can learn from this moment, but it might not be what you expect me to say. I don't think there's any subject that can't be joked about by anyone in any context ever, so saying, don't joke about this topic isn't useful. Now, the cast of Critical Role jokes about this topic all the time. I'm also well aware there are plenty of people who play D&D who aren't necessarily good at reading social cues for any number of reasons, so saying something like, read the room, isn't useful advice either. I know some folks are going to want a clear-cut definition on when this sort of joke is appropriate and when it isn't, but I don't believe anything in humor is quite that simple. Instead, I'll say this situation would have been far improved if he had said, seen the reaction and said something like, sorry, that was over the line. And then after the game, he could have approached Laura or Matt or Travis and said something like, I didn't mean to offend anyone. Can you tell me why it bothered you? That way I can do better next time. Nobody wants to offend the people they're playing D&D with. I mean, unless you're an asshole, but I'm assuming you aren't. You're a nice person. I can tell that about you. But we all cross lines from time to time. And sometimes all you can do is apologize and show willingness to learn from your mistakes and better yourself. This is also the scene when Tiberius references being an ambassador for Draconia, a title he received when he took the Mending Wheel to Draconia and showed it to his former teachers and his father. I suspect this happened in a pre-stream game, or during the six-month break the characters took as the player switched editions, but there's also a chance that Orion decided this on his own, linking it to the trip he took to buy a bag of holding in Draconia without talking to anyone about that. As we saw from that scene, it sure seems like Orion seemed to believe he had full agency over whatever happened when he was in Draconia. But he doesn't have that authority. Draconia is part of the world of the game, which means what happens there is up to Matt's discretion. I've played in games where players have a lot more power to determine what happens in between sessions. They can come up with those answers on their own, and then the DM will riff off of those answers during the session itself. But that is not this game. Again, that's just speculation, but since nobody else in the cast seemed to know Tiberius was an ambassador to Dracronia, it's an educated guess based on the limited information we have available. Now, it's not really the point, there's a more there's more egregious examples ahead, but as we'll discuss later, his mentality around Draconia is something that needed to be addressed, were he to continue with the campaign beyond this episode. Okay, it's time. Let's talk about the errands. Again, Read the room isn't useful advice for everyone, but I would say that there are some things we can keep in mind from this situation. One is to be mindful of how much time you're taking up with your projects, especially when nobody else at the table is involved in what you're doing. We'll see this plenty of times on Critical Role where the cast pauses to let one or two people have a dramatic scene, but it always helps when there are other players involved and it's not just one player with the DM. If it doesn't involve anyone else, then try to be respectful of everyone else's time. In this case, Tiberius' first batch of errands lasts for 12 uninterrupted minutes. Then a few other cast members do some projects, and then Orion jumps in with other stuff he wanted to do. And at 10 errands, he absolutely does the most errands, and he, bog he bogarts the time at the table during this sequence. The full scene of everyone running errands and doing projects takes 45 minutes, and his errands took about 15 minutes in total. That means one player out of seven took one-third of that time doing stuff that no one else was involved in. Now there isn't like a perfect formula here that needs to be employed in order to maximize happiness at the table. Grog's only errand was to buy a shovel and a pickaxe and to roll for some beard checks. Because he only spent one minute on his errands, does that mean everyone else should only spend one minute on theirs? Obviously not. 
And throughout the run of Critical Role, we'll see the party split up to get things done. Some of those scenes will be brief, while others will lead to long sequences, as long as 15 minutes or even 30 minutes sometimes. And even though some of those instances might bother you as an audience member, they clearly don't bother Matt or the cast. Generally, the rest of the cast will just sit patiently and watch these sequences play out. So, why is this one so different? Well, setting aside the context that there was possibly, say even likely, behind-the-scenes tension brewing due to his erratic behavior and substance abuse issues, which hopefully is not a factor at your own tables, I do think we can still learn from this moment. There are a few aspects at play in the table that make the situation more tense and or frustrating for the rest of the cast than it needed to be. One thing that makes a scene like this easier for the other players to sit through is the feeling of respect. If they know that you're going to give the same respect on their turn, they're more willing to give you space to do what you need to do during your scene. But as I mentioned earlier, when he's not in a scene, it was very common to see Orion disengage. Even during this sequence, he interrupts or disrupts some of the other cast members' errands. While Liam describes Vax's errands, he buys some stakes for himself and for Tiberius. Then Orion asks Matt about the price of wooden stakes, and then tells Matt, quote, Tell him that he bought me 20 more. Tell him, meaning he's asking Matt to tell Liam, that he, Liam, bought me 20 more stakes. That's a very strange way to make the request to get Vax to buy more wooden stakes for you. Liam is right there. You can communicate that to him as a request like you did for the earlier request for stakes. Throughout Taliesin's projects, Orion jumps in twice and says that he can do the Death Ray project instead if Taliesin wants to do other things. And obviously he means well, he's trying to help with that project so they can make the best use of Percy's time. But Taliesin heard him the first time. And as Matt says after Orion offers a second time, Taliesin has already given his answer. Talking over the others and not giving their errands the time to breathe adds to an atmosphere where the other players don't necessarily trust that you will respect their time. So then, when you take quite a bit of time for your own projects, it makes that situation worse and continues to reinforce the feeling that you aren't taking their time into consideration. And to make matters worse, at the top of this entire errands sequence, Matt asked for this to be quick. Throughout Tiberius' errands, the other cast members remind him that this section was meant to be quick. So taking such a long time to do everything, to co collect all of the magic, continues to show disrespect toward their time. Another thing that helps is treating the world of the game like a real world. This is something I've argued has been a bit of an issue for all the cast members in this first run of episodes, but by this point in the show, Tiberius is the character who suffers from this the most. This goes hand in hand with learning nothing from the death of the old woman. From my perspective, there's this pervasive feeling that he's not really treating the world of the game like a realistic place. In this episode, we see this in part with his repeated attempts to enter the Cloudtop District, or his proposal to invite Sovereign Uriel to a fancy dinner, because he just isn't registering the consequences of their earlier actions. But honestly, I can think of no better example of that mentality in this episode than when he goes and tries to buy every mirror in Amman. It's an absurd request, even from a logistics perspective. And again, I wonder if his plan was to use telekinesis. If so, then he would likely run into the exact same issue he ran into later in the episode when he tried to catch both Vax and Scanlan. Telekinesis only targets one object or creature at a time. Thanks to his circlet, he could maybe concentrate on two mirrors at a time for 12 seconds. Maybe if he could use sorcerer points to twin the spells, he could handle four mirrors at once. So if he did indeed plan to use telekinesis, it seems that he had not run this plan past Matt. And if he tried to pull this trick out in combat with a vampire, he likely would have found out in the moment that he couldn't execute the plan as he intended to. Now maybe his plan didn't involve telekinesis after all, it ultimately doesn't matter. What matters more is the fact that he made these requests that were, frankly, brazen in how he regarded the world of the game as a tool toward his own ends, and not as a realistic place. The same goes for when he tries to cast two types of magic on the same item and has to be told repeatedly that this isn't how the magic works, before Matt finally insists that since Tiberius wants to try anyway, he loses 500 gold in this effort before learning that this isn't how magic works. Another issue we see revealed in this sequence is Tiberius' ongoing quest for power. This has played out across the past six episodes or so, ever since that time he ran out of sorcerer points in Vasselheim. Before that, it wasn't out of character for him to seek out cool items. We saw that with the trade for Scanlan's item. And we know he has crafted plenty of magic items for the party. Almost everyone in the group is carrying an item from the pre-stream games that was enchanted or enhanced by Tiberius. But his quest to, in Matt's words during the scene, get all the magic, has become disruptive. And at a certain point, it doesn't matter whether the items you're crafting are meant to help the party or not, 
it's still an issue when it slows games down. And when you become single-minded in your feeling that you need more magic in order to be useful and cool, when you're honestly plenty useful and cool already. He's a high-level sorcerer, level 11 at this point. And if he just embraced that, then it would honestly be better for everyone. But his fixation over these past few episodes on trying to get every possible magical boon and buff that he can has become distracting and disruptive. And of course, a lot of this, in fact, a lot of Tiberius's actions from across his entire run circle the same core trait, one that a lot of us can identify in Tiberius. Main character syndrome. Professor Dungeon Master made a fantastic video about this type of player using Tiberius's behavior as the archetype. If you haven't watched it, I strongly recommend you do so. I don't want to rip off his entire video. He covers a lot more than just main character syndrome, but I want to touch on the behavior we see in this episode, or we just see a lot across his entire run, like the repeated offenses, that mark Orion as someone with main character syndrome in his time on the show. If Tiberius has the tool to solve a situation, he has to be the one to solve it. I defended one instance of this at the end of the Beholder fight in episode 11, but the fact is, it happens constantly, across all 27 episodes. From as early as that moment in episode 1 when he came over to the table to chime in and use his high persuasion skill, to as late as the telekinesis argument at the end of this episode. And this approach has two major effects. The first is that he's more likely to run out of resources more quickly, which of course feeds his fear of feeling underpowered and spurs on his quest to get more magic. And the second is that it means the other players don't get a chance to do as many cool things as they could if Tiberius wasn't trying to be the one to solve every problem. So here's a lesson. Share the spotlight. Let other people have a chance to play the game. You don't have to be all things to all situations. That doesn't mean you have to sit on the sidelines all the time either, but it's okay to let other people try, and maybe even fail, to solve problems before you jump in every time with your own solution. On the subject of those failed enchantments, here's another lesson. When your DM tells you how magic works, don't try to force the issue. The DM is responsible for making the world feel cohesive and run by consistent rules. And three times in a row, Matt says that enchantments can't be stacked. First, he offers a compromise for the water bottle. It will fill the bottle with holy water once per day, and then the rest of the water, which is drawn from the elemental plane of water, will be regular water. Second, he tells Tiberius that enchanting a crossbow bolt to conjure a holy fog cloud wouldn't work because those two enchantments can't stack. Then, when Tiberius pivots to asking about mixing a sleep spell and a fog cloud spell, Matt says the exact same thing. The enchantments don't stack. And when Tiberius insists he just wants to try really hard, Matt tells him to go ahead and roll, and then regardless of the result, it didn't work. He cost a lot of money in the effort. So, stop trying. Now, I don't want to claim that you should never ask follow-up questions or see if there's anything you can do to try to get what you want. If you feel the DM's ruling conflicts with a previous ruling, you can ask about that. But bear in mind that the DM might have a reason for changing it now, and it's still always ultimately their call. And it's especially worth making sure the DM understands exactly what you want if you feel there's a chance they didn't understand you properly. That can happen too. All dungeon masters are just human beings. They can make mistakes. That statement about DMs being human beings will age really poorly if anybody ever successfully launches an AI DM, but I've seen AI try to make art with hands, so even if all the dungeon masters are robots, I stand by the statement that dungeon masters can make mistakes. But if you don't have an argument besides, what if I try really hard? It's time to let it go. Speaking of letting things go, when someone at the table flat out says, let's move on, it's probably time to move on. You are bogarting the time at the table. Honestly, it would have been worth Orion showing this list of tasks to the other cast members and perhaps seeing who could have gotten involved in some of them, or if some of them would have said something like, you don't have to waste your time with that, we don't need to do that, or they aren't going to let our servant into the cloud top district, or just wait and send your dad a message once we actually have the evidence, or maybe even... That's not how your spell works, don't waste your money on those mirrors. Tiberius's next errand is to send a messenger to Lord Daxio to ask to convert the prison cells into barracks, and it doesn't seem like anybody else at the table had been consulted on this errand. It's not really his right to decide unilaterally what they're doing with the fundamental structure of their keep. In theory, it's a valid point. If they want to rehabilitate their reputations, an argument could be made that keeping prisoners doesn't serve that end. But... That depends a lot on who they're keeping prisoner, doesn't it? If they dragged Lady Briarwood into that cell instead of a maimed coachman, that would be a very different situation. I mean, it actually would have been worse. It would have gotten them into much worse trouble with Sovereign Uriel, but the point stands. I don't think having the prison is the issue so much as who they're putting in there. Additionally, I'm curious who he meant when he wanted to convert the prison into barracks for troops. Did he mean the army he wanted to call? 
I don't think so. I mean, they likely would meet Vox Machina in Whitestone, so I doubt they'd need to stay at the Keep in Amon. That's way out of the way. I think he meant that this would provide lodging for their guards. But I assume the staff resides on the premises already, no? Their cook and butler certainly do. And if their guards don't, they probably have their own homes. The point is, the Keep wasn't created by Tiberius, so he shouldn't be making unilateral decisions about it. Also, if he'd looped someone else in, they certainly could have reminded him that Lord Daxio was in the Cloudtop District, and told him that the entire errand was doomed to fail anyway. Okay, speaking of that army, the last errand Tiberius takes care of is to send a message to his father, asking him to rally an army of wyvern riders. This is something a lot of commenters have discussed, either in this episode's comments on YouTube, or on the comments for a lot of my other Tiberius videos, probably in the comments for this one as well. A lot of people have pointed out that Orion trying to rally an army is essentially a way to cut Percy out of his own storyline. Now, I absolutely agree, but before I explain why, I'm going to play a bit of Devil's Advocate. First, we do have the benefit of hindsight to know that this was a fantastic arc for Percy's character. I'm not saying we're operating off of information Orion couldn't have had. The cast had already heard Percy recount what happened to his family, and they'd already met the Briarwoods in battle and seen how nasty they could be. But we obviously know that one of the most beloved Critical Role storylines is about to start. And we know that if Tiberius had summoned an army, it would have been a lot less dramatic. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Second, Orion is attempting to make this personal to Tiberius. And in theory, that's a really good skill to be able to employ as a player. I'd much rather a player find reasons for their character to care about the adventure than ever hear another player say the words, Oh, my character wouldn't go on that mission. And third, Orion is not the only player I've ever seen do this. There are times in your career as a D&D player where you might have the opportunity to rally an army to your side to deal with the enemy forces. Vox Machina does it like three or four times. In fact, in the early days of the hobby, the ultimate goal was often to obtain a keep and gather an army and become a local noble. Matt Colville published two whole books about this playstyle. In theory, this is a perfectly reasonable strategy for the right arc. I don't think I can really co-sign trying to pull this trick on this arc, considering invading a sovereign nation is literally an act of war, but again, that's why it's good to run these ideas by your other players, to see if they agree with such an extreme measure or not. But... If you've been following my last few Tiberius episodes, you probably know what I'm going to say. This maneuver is a perfectly fine strategic decision for this arc. For a different type of game. Again, with the slightest of concessions that this would be the first time the cast would play through an arc fully structured around one specific player's backstory, so maybe Orion didn't know what to expect, most of the cast seemed to know that this was going to be a personal mission for Percy. And their role in the story is to support him, not find the fastest, most convenient solution to their problems. Throughout these episodes, Tiberius takes a couple of opportunities to highlight the ways that this arc is personal for him. In this episode, he recounts being enfeebled by Delilah, which isn't actually what the other people in the scene were talking about. They were talking about the charm effect from Silas that had afflicted Vax, Asum, and Uriel, but fine, he may have misunderstood. And then he loudly announces that he hates the Briarwoods. Okay, fine, but when most of the cast is saying things like, we're here for you, Percival, highlighting how much you also hate them does, in a way, act as yet another way for you to hijack this arc and make it about yourself. And that's certainly what calling in an army does as well. This is Percy's arc, is about him coming home and dealing with his baggage in a way he hasn't yet. There's literally a voice in his ear whispering the word, Vengeance. And Orion does understand that on some level. He takes a minute in this episode to promise Percy that he will get a chance to use his gun against all the peoples whose names are etched into the barrel. But recruiting an army for this kind of adventure does, effectively, undercut that sentiment drastically by trying to find the most convenient solution. And also, of course, making this something that you solved instead of allowing anybody else a chance to contribute to the events of this D&D game. Now, that doesn't mean that any game that doesn't run this kind of backstory-centric arc is the kind of game where you can automatically get access to an army just because you asked. Tiberius' father still makes an excellent point. An ambassador and a prince cannot declare war on another nation and expect it to be considered binding and legal. That's literally the inciting incident for the first Thor movie. Trying to declare war can get you banished to save face and stop that war. If you're running a more Colville-style game where armies and nations and feudalism are major factors that matter in the world then trying to recruit an army would still absolutely not be a slam dunk. Again, see the fact that someone published two books of rules about how to get that army and get the keeps and stuff. Additionally, a DM can always decide that you can't get an army or can't deploy an army because it would make the arc more boring. Armies run the risk of making these sorts of adventures less dramatic because certain obstacles that are intended to be challenges suddenly become extremely easy. 
Again, that's not to say that there are no adventures or campaigns where controlling an army can still be dramatic and not reduce the tension, but that's ultimately just one reason why a DM might not allow you to have access to that army that you so badly want. To quote Laura Bailey when Orion tried to enhance either of his magical rings, how about we stick to the level we're at? Alright, we're finally moving on from the errands. Later in the episode, when Tiberius wants to use telekinesis to both catch Vax and Scanlan, and Matt says no, Orion's outburst is not appropriate. D&D is a game. The DM is adjudicating the rules, that's their job. An outburst like this is frankly over the line. It's okay to be emotionally invested in the story, that's a good thing. But don't level your frustrations about not being able to solve every problem at the DM. That's not okay. Especially if what you're doing is literally trying to break the rules of the game. The DM saying no is not the problem in that scenario. When the party camps for the night, Tiberius tries to use his researcher trait and finds out that's not how it works. I talked about this in the last episode, he really should have sat down with Matt away from the table and talked about backstory traits and figured out what made the most sense. He badly mishandled that situation, and this could have been avoided with proper communication. And that is everything. Well, almost everything. There's also... Well, remember that joke? Let's talk about that joke. Interlude 2. Okay, let's talk about the joke. Actually, you know what? I've seen people take my comments about Tiberius and interpret them in bad faith ways, or at least in ways I did not intend to uh, draw the opposite conclusion of what I meant, and I really think that actually sitting down and talking about why jokes do and don't work opens up a lot of potential for people like that to start making worse jokes at their D&D tables, and that is not what I want. So I'm actually going to save this section of the video for just the Patreon version of the video. So if you want to see me talk about why uh, Sam's jokes are generally regarded as not an issue, but Orion's joke was, um, then check out the Patreon. And if you're annoyed by that, it was ruined by other people. There's specifically a guy who keeps making videos about Orion and keeps citing my video and seems to hate Sam. And I just, I just don't want to give people like that ammunition uh, to talk about this subject more. Um, so uh, check this out on the Patreon version of the video. Part 3. Why we talk about Tiberius. When Orion left Critical Role, the online spaces were quickly filled with a lot of speculation, and so the cast asked that people please respect Orion's and the cast's privacy, and essentially drop the subject. And the critter community, especially the moderators of online spaces, have essentially had a zero-tolerance policy for further discussion around Tiberius in the years since. There are pluses and minuses to this approach. Obviously, given some of the behavior he exhibited directly after his departure from the show, it was wise not to give him a platform at that time, and it's not really incumbent on the fandom to extend him an olive branch now when their goal is to instead protect fans from harassment. And since there aren't really any ongoing updates or news or relevant developments to discussing Critical Role, then all that can really happen is rampant speculation and complaints about one player's behavior. That's not especially productive, so I can understand the value of limiting discussion. However, this has led to other community members who are not moderators of subreddits or other groups, basically picking up this mindset and carrying it with them. And now we have a situation where sometimes a new fan to Critical Role will try to get information about what happened and who is this other character they've never heard of who was there in the first episode of Vox Machina in the live stream but not in the cartoon, and they'll be met with a chorus of fans basically echoing the same refrain. We don't talk about Tiberius. Just imagine I put a clip from We Don't Talk About Bruno here, or maybe I did a parody song about Tiberius, rewrote all the lyrics to be about the things he did on the show. I don't know, whatever, I'm not doing that shit. And you shouldn't do that either, don't do that. Now, that zero discussion ever mindset can make this subject pretty impenetrable to a lot of folks. Unless you happen to find the one page on the subreddit that collects the relevant links and lays out the timeline, it's very hard for new people who are interested in this fandom to learn what happened. But even so, the information is out there, and the solution is actually easy. When someone asks who Tiberius is and what happened to Orion, don't tell them, we don't talk about that, he left and it's over. Send them a link to the subreddit article about it. The link is below. Honestly, it would help new people a lot if critters just made that the established practice. Problem solved. But if the solution was that easy, then why bother talking about this? Why have I continued to, as some critters claim in my comments, violate the explicit request of the fans and community by continuing to talk about this? 
Well, first, I don't really think that's what the cast meant, that we should never, ever talk about the subject ever again in any context. I could be wrong. Maybe they did. But even if that is the case, I do have a reason. Because I have been the Tiberius of a group before. No, thankfully I wasn't suffering from the same behind-the-scenes issues as Orion. I wasn't sick. I wasn't struggling with substance abuse. I was in my right mind. But arguably, isn't that worse, in a way? There was nothing impacting my sense of judgment. I was just being kind of an asshole. And a lot of other people from the comments of my first video have shared the same sentiment. That the video helped them understand how some of their own behavior was disruptive at the table. And it's helped them become a better player. And again, they weren't sick. They weren't dealing with substances. They were just, like me, being kind of an asshole. Now, not all of that behavior is the same, and not all of it happens for the same reasons. For example, I wasn't trying to abuse concentration spells. Although, I did do that, I just kept forgetting about the rule. But as a counterpoint, I found that I have had a lot more instances of trying to insist to newer players how they should play, far more than Orion ever did in any of his episodes. So that's why I've been doing this. I found that there's a lot of value in not just laying out what happened, but why. And more specifically, how we can learn from it. There were some major surprises as I went through this journey as well. I discovered on my rewatch that the arguments that Tiberius was metagaming in episode 11 are, from my own perspective, pretty flimsy. I mean, arguably, maybe he didn't want to get hit by the Beholder's layer actions, and maybe the cast hadn't dealt with layer actions yet, so he was metagaming by referencing that, but if you have a player who has flipped through the monster manual because they're also a dungeon master, then I don't think it would be metagaming for them to be aware of the concept of layer actions existing in the world. Reading that book shouldn't disqualify you from being aware that there are dangers that might happen. Unfortunately, as we witnessed in episode 25, we know what it looks like when Orion metagames. It's unmistakable. Speaking of surprises, I had always remembered his outbursts in episode 21, but I was so surprised to return to it and see how quickly he tries to move on and keep having fun with his friends. It really seems like he had learned lessons from the prior incidents, and it's actually really sad to watch that episode now and know that his behavior in the subsequent episodes is actually going to get worse and not better. And I hope that my commentary across the past 27 videos about Orion have been valuable to people, because I really wish someone had done this when I was a player. I caught up with Critical Role pretty early on, maybe right around the time Orion left, either just before or just after. And I was aware that he had a metagaming problem. And then I would hear myself talk on our own actual play show and realize I was that person in our group. But I wish someone had made these videos back then, that someone had taken the time to break down exactly what was wrong with some of this behavior and why it was disruptive or distracting or disrespectful. But I think the biggest realization I had is that so much of Orion's behavior wasn't necessarily toxic for every D&D game. Some of it, for sure. But I've seen a lot of other games over the years since 2015. I've played at tables for a session or two and found they weren't the right fit. I've watched actual play shows or listened to DM advice podcasts and then dipped out pretty quickly because their style just rubbed me the wrong way. And I can say that for some of Orion's behavior, emphasis on some, there is a table where some of it would have been welcome. In fact, a lot of that behavior wasn't an issue for two years of home games, and arguably for a dozen episodes of the live stream. But they used to play eight hour games once every month or two, and now they were playing for three hours every week. So the game changed. And that's okay. People change. Games change. And while it certainly seems from Orion's statements that he left the show primarily due to his personal issues behind the scenes, it's also undeniable that there was a lot of tension in his final few episodes. And while the mitigating circumstances should not be ignored when discussing Orion's personal journey, I do think that we, as D&D players, can still learn from what happened at the table itself. Of course, not everyone will feel the same way. Some people will still feel that it's gross for me to keep making videos about Orion and dragging up this dirt. And truly, I have seen more Tiberius videos since my first video came out. Although, some of those predate my video, so maybe just my video has screwed up my analytics, I don't know. Honestly, some of those videos, the timing probably has a lot more to do with the Legend of Vox Machina cartoon bringing new eyes to the live stream. But, if my videos have invited more opportunities for viewers to dig up dirt and bug Orion or any of the cast members of Critical Role to figure out what happened, I really do apologize for that. That was never my intention. But for some of these videos, including mine, I hope, I think there's a value to discussing this stuff. And I'm also very grateful that these videos have found their audience. Players like myself who didn't realize what we were doing at the table was disruptive. Or to be more accurate, didn't realize why, or didn't know how to stop. 
That's why I've been making these videos. And if they've made it easier for some people to find a way to play D&D with their friends without friction, then I will consider this year well spent. So this ends my time in the Tiberius Trenches. As far as I'm concerned, I'm done talking about Orion on my channel. And I truly hope we've all learned something from these videos. And I want to thank you so much for watching. This video marks the one year anniversary of my channel, and I just want to thank my absolutely incredible audience. I'm going to hold a live stream Q&A about this video next week. My birthday is also coming up on the 11th, and I suspect we've got a 300,000 subscriber live stream coming pretty soon. So you can expect to see me go live a few more times in April. But I'm going to do a live stream on Wednesday, April 5th to answer questions about this video specifically. I hope to see you there. I also promised in my 25,000 subscriber live stream that I would give away some dice. I'm going to give away 25 sets of dice to some folks who comment on this video. I will pick my favorite 25 comments and the folks who wrote them will receive a dice set. I will not let you know in the comments for this video. If you see someone doing that, that is spam. It is not me. Instead, I will announce the winners in my final video for April on April 27th. It will be the demystified installment where I talk about episode 29, Whispers. We hit 25,000 subscribers at the beginning of the year, and we got another 5,000 really quickly in just a few months, and I'm so grateful for that. But I also know a lot of people who watch these videos are not subscribed. So let's do another giveaway, if we can get another few thousand subscribers in the next month. I turn 35 on April 11th. If we can get to 35,000 subscribers by the end of April, by midnight on April 30th, I will do another dice giveaway, and I will give away 35 sets of dice. All of these are dice sets I've had for years. They've all been rolled. They're all awesome. Some of these sets aren't made up of matching dice anymore, but if you get some non-matching dice, I'll be sure to throw in some extra dice for you as well, so just to make up for it. I also really want to thank everyone who supported me on Patreon. I don't put Patreon credits in my videos because my goal is to work far enough in advance that the Patreon credits would be really out of date, and I just don't think that's very rewarding for people. However, in this case, I really want to show my appreciation for everybody who has supported me by thanking my patrons. Some of these folks have had to cancel their memberships over the past year because their financial situations have changed, but I still want to show them my support by thanking them. Their names are on the screen right now. This past year has been absolutely incredible, and I have some truly wonderful videos in the works that I am so excited for you to see, and I would not be where I am today without my Patreon supporters. I also want to thank the wonderful people who have joined my Discord server. As of this recording, we've just added two new moderators. We are expanding the team in part because the server has been growing so much, and we want to make sure we have some more support to help the folks in the server. But we also wanted to recruit people from other backgrounds to help fill in the gaps created by our own privileges, and to make sure everyone in the server is being treated with as much respect and dignity as possible. The people of that server are so wonderful, I truly could not be happier with the wonderful, amazing, fantastic community that these fine folks have built together. I barely have a, anything to say about that, like I haven't helped with that, that's all them. And hey, if you want to catch some other updates when I have them, you can sign up for my newsletter. All those links are in the doobly-doo below. The Patreon, the Discord, the newsletter, all that's down there. Some of my more recent non-critical role videos don't tend to fare as well in the algorithm. Uh, here's one that I would love if you could show some love. I'm really proud of it. I'm proud of all my videos, but please check this one out. Until next time, play fair and have fun.